and welcome to another episode of The Woolly Thistle. I'm Corrine, I own The Woolly Thistle and this is my co-host and marketing manager extraordinaire, Maggie. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and we're back with you for another very full episode. It's kind of incredible how much stuff we have to talk about uh, during these podcasts, but we really appreciate you watching. So if you're new here, welcome. We hope you enjoy the show. And if you're returning, thank you so much. We appreciate you coming back and leaving lovely comments. Um, just to start off on the right foot, we do have a correction from last time where we misspelled Tully Mongan uh, for her Ravel rename. So what are yeah. we talking about, Maggie? Uh, we showed off Mary's beautiful work. This is her Indigo Shadows cowl pattern. Um, and we spelled her Ravelry ID name wrong. Yeah. Um, but it's Mary O'Shea, Tully Mungan on Ravelry. Um, it's a beautiful cowl. It this uses, is knitted with Jagger spun. Yeah, you use two skeins of Jagger and it uses almost all of the skeins. It's just beautiful. Yeah, so it's two skeins worth, so 200 grams. And um, we believe that quite a few viewers actually yeah. bought the pattern. So thanks for supporting Mary with that yeah. and the yarn as well. I need to get this beautiful cow back in the mail to Mary, but... Um, and, and we try really hard to get names right, so apologies that that yeah. one slipped through. Um, okay, so we have a great show today. We have segments such as more of Rachel from Fair Isle. She's going to be answering questions, viewer yep. questions. Uh, we have Caitlin joining us and she is extending her, her um, fleece study, if yeah. I remember. And then we have an interview with Rachel of Daughter of a Shepherd. So that's exciting. So stay around, watch the whole thing because it's all really, really good. Um, shall we announce a winner? Yeah. Let's start with that then. Um, so the first winner from the last episode is Pat Sinopole. She said, or they said, I always enjoy your podcast. You talk about yarn and knitting, and I feel like other podcasts about knitting I've watched sometimes drift away from knitting. I'm always also loving your yarn descriptions. It always makes me want to try them. Thank you so much for all the beautiful pattern ideas and information you provide as well. Looking forward always to the next podcast. Great. Well, so, thank you. Thank you so much for watching, Pat. If you want to email us at info at the Wooly Thistle, put prize winner in all caps in the subject line. We will get your $25 gift card out to you. Hooray! And if you want to be in the running for um, a randomly selected uh, gift card to the Wooly Thistle, all you need to do is leave a comment, give us a thumbs up, and subscribe to the channel. And we will be giving away another prize before yep. the end of the show, so mm -hmm. make sure you're around for that because it might be you. Um, one thing I think we should mention at the top of the show, though, is community and the really difficult stuff that's been happening the last, well, two to three weeks since uh, but when this goes live. Yeah. I think everybody is feeling very pained by... Um, what happened in Texas and Buffalo, and uh, we are working, uh, we may have decided by the time this actually goes live, and you'll hear from us in an email, but we're working on how we can contribute um, to some charities or fundraising, things like that, to help um, help with these terrible problems. But what we notice, at least I notice personally, and I'm sure you do too, that our craft and crafting really does help us get through these times. And we just wanted to remind you that we have a very vibrant and welcoming um, community, uh, both on Facebook. We have a Facebook group that you can join and you will be welcome with open arms. And we have Ravelry too, which I think we have 6,000 members in or something crazy it's, it's like that. It's over 6,500. Yeah, I mean. It's still very active. Yeah, very active. It's so warm and friendly. Yeah, and that's been around for a long time since we started. So mm -hmm. um, you're welcome there. And we also have a Knitting Buddies program, which we do like to remind people of because uh, we started it during COVID when people we were aware that people were going to feel isolated um, being in lockdown. And so we started it then and it was really, really successful and groups are still going and we keep that open because when tragedy strikes, you know, we might just want to be with some other knitters and we might not have knitters in our community. So um, we wanted to remind you of that and uh, we'll put in the show notes underneath yeah, uh, a link where you can sign up for that and then we match you up with uh, two or three other buddies who are also looking for community yeah. um, on a small scale. 
Yeah, and we've put that link in both our Ravelry and our Facebook group. Um, if you've had a Knitting Buddy group before and maybe it's petered out, you're always welcome to sign up for a new Absolutely. group. Absolutely. We will continue to match you. Um, should mention too, it's a free program. So yep. um, there's yep. no it's commitment to the Wooly Thistle at all. We just pair you up with other Yeah, it's just people. a way of um, being connected uh, with other knitters. Yeah. I know it's called Knitting Buddies, but I, I, it's really open to any fiber enthusiast. Of course. If you're a crocheter or a spinner or a weaver or whatever it is that floats your boat <laughs> with yarn. Should, um, they, should they mention that in their application? They can if you want to make a note in there. That way, we if if other people also mention that that is their preferred craft, we can try to pair you up. But yeah. as long as you're flexible and knowing that it may not be possible, depending on who else signs up. Yep. Um, but we'll do our best to match you up um, with you know people of shared similar interests. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we just wanted to mention that that's what we can do. We'll also do something um, to uh, raise awareness or you know. We haven't decided at the point at this point of recording, but we will decide what the best thing is we can do to to help these very sad events um, and help us deal with that. So, um, okay, so let's move on to what I'm wearing, which is no wool. <laughs> I feel undressed. I feel naked. I need some wool. But Maggie, how are you what, functioning? <laughs> I don't know. I just showed up, and this is it. <laughs> Very rarely do you show. You know what you should do? You should knit a scrunchie or something. Oh, that's a great hair. idea. <laughs> Isn't that great? Well, I was joking with you earlier that I was going to knit this massive long eye cord that changes colors, and I'm going to wear that as a necklace. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I, like the finger knitting, um, one of yeah. the kids had. I think one of the kids' friends actually finger knit like a really long, it's like a really long rainbow. Uh -huh. Our cats love it. Aww. They just chase it all over the place. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I'm not coming to your house wearing it then. No. But I think I might do You'd something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that would be nice. Just, you know, for the summer when, yeah. when you can't wear wool. Yeah. yeah, better. But let's scrunchies. let's hear what you're wearing. Um, I'm wearing a scarf I wove. Um, Isn't she amazing? So, <laughs> I, have, so I haven't amazing. had anything on the loom. I'm I'm still a newbie weaver. I what kind of loom a, do you have? I have an um, what kind of I have a shacked flip rigid heddle. Okay, um, Richard. I had to think about it. <laughs> A, Richard again. A Richard Heddle, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I had, um, oh. this was just out of stash. Um, it was like two skeins of, um, I didn't like the way it knit up at all. So I started knitting it. I bought it because the colors, I just thought they were so fun. It looked like, it looked like bubblegum ice cream. It looks, yeah, it looks like candy. Yeah. Um, but I hated it knit up. Like I, you know how sometimes you get yeah. variegated yeah. yarns and then yeah. you start to knit with it, and you're like, Argh. so what it, <laughs> so is this? Like a, is this a merino? So it is. Yeah, I think it's a superwash like merino. Like a sock yarn type. Um, yeah, gorgeous. And Just amazing. I had it in stash and it wasn't working. So when I first got the rigid heddle, I'm like, well, I'll throw these on there and weave it up and see and what. Were you like. amazed? I was completely amazed because. It, it's I amazing. Love it. I love it woven. Like it looks like little, just little. Do you remember? Did you? Do you remember? So... Like growing up, I don't know if you had licorice all sorts, where they would there would be like a little candy, a little candy, and it would be covered in bumps of like pink and different blue and things like that. That's what it reminds me of. I'll need to find some from home. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't know. Oh yeah, that's it's what just, it looks it like. Remind, this, the colorway reminded me of. Um, like bubble gum ice yeah. cream. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen that. So. Yeah. Um, Gorgeous. But, yeah, so I've been wearing that. You're so clever, Maggie. It's, she spins beautiful yarn. <laughs> she weaves beautiful scarves. I can, I really, like, I've, I've just tipped a toe in the... Well, that's a, that's a, uh, that's impressive. I know. I mean, the yarn really does a lot. Um, I like your little twists. Was that easy to do? Yeah, it's easy to do. You just kind of twist them. It doesn't untwist, like, though? No. That's in, see, I didn't know and that. And I know there are little tools that can help you, but I just use my you did. fingers. Yeah. I just use my, instead of buying another tool. Yeah. Um, but. That's one of the things I love about knitting, though, is the lack of tools needed. You need yarn, and you need your pins, right. and that's it. And I think that, like, obviously you could do, like, I watched a video, and yeah, it was easy. Yeah. No, I am getting really, really uh, weaving curious, mm -hmm. and uh, Grady just sent an email that I was like, oh. I know, she told me that, that I guess there's an open house coming up locally, and... Um, at a weaving studio. At a weaving studio, and I'm like, what kind of looms do they use? And she pulled up the photo, I'm like, send that to Karina. <laughs> <laughs> she did. I opened it, and I was like, oh. Yeah. Exciting. Might, so, yes. You might I'm, need to dip your toe. I might. I might. 
I might. Treat I'm, yourself, <laughs> Treat yourself. That sounds good to me. Yeah, right? <laughs> okay, so, so that's it. That's what I'm Is wearing. that what you're wearing? Yeah. No, but what are you drinking, Maggie? Oh, well, I always have my coffee. I like my coffee. <laughs> and I have a cute little mug cozy. Look at you representing. It's the, it's the Babel Mug Cozy by Donna Smith. Yeah. I will say this was my first Steak project. So was it? It was. Cause Did you do this a long time ago? No, maybe like a year ago. It was during, it was like when the pandemic hit. It was yeah. one of those, well, it's not now, not when. And what did you do? Finish a little eye cord around it? Yeah, so I followed the pattern. Like she she walks you through it and um, Maggie, I can you're see amazing. if I can slip it off. So this is a great little pattern from uh, Donna Smith, who was mm -hmm. just on the Hap Cal um, interview. I don't want to spill my coffee to get it off, but it's worth showing the inside. Yeah. There we go. And it's adorable. What, what um, yarn did you use? I used Janus. Yeah. Jameson and Smith. And I just went stash diving. Uh, yeah. So it's not the exact colors in the pattern, but I just Lovely went though. greens and blues. But yeah. we'll turn it inside out. You can see that. That's always fun to see the inside. Yeah. But then, yeah, she has you, you knit, you know, steak stitches. Yeah. Um, so when you first finish it, it's all closed and you have the eye cord there. So you do the eye cord and then you cut it? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Um, it and was, isn't it, it like was, magic? It was like magic. I'm like, wait, that's it? I cut it and it's over? And yeah, because... It just holds... I didn't I didn't reinforce anything. It was a mug cozy, so yeah. it felt very low risk. Yeah. And also, um, just the way it happens, those um, edges always fold in yeah. and under. Yeah, they just fold it. And, and so you don't see them on the right side. They're all so lovely it's a nice, neat. clean yeah. edge. And I, I'd like to knit one for, like, my coffee mug yeah. that's not steaked. Yeah. Like for my for my travel mug. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get right on that. I know. I know. This well these are good, you know, warmer weather projects cuz they're so tiny and not not too Yeah, if you want lap. something quick and satisfying, occasionally I need a quick and dirty. Yeah. Oh my gosh, what are you knitting on? Do you want to show first? Yeah, no, okay. No, no, we always do me first. We, okay. We well, it's because I'm such a good host. I know. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, or so we could show my at all. Yes, gosh. As a, as Back I to you. Back, <laughs> Back to me. Maggie has an FO and it's super I duper. An FO. It's super freaking massive. Here. Oh, and it's lovely. Little. Again, we're covering Maggie. I know. It's yeah. okay. There we go. But amazing. Beautiful. I can't, I can't back up far enough. No, it's so, beautiful. I love it so much. Look at the, and this is the medium. It's enormous. But you did use a lovely, big, yeah. squishy. I used Armsco Manor Black Welsh Mountain 4 ply. It is really loosened up too, hasn't What's it? What's great is, so I bought three skeins of the Black Welsh Mountain 4 ply. This only used two. The whole thing. The whole thing. Wow. So <laughs> they are they are generous skeins. I don't remember the yardage in them. Um, but, but it's a four ply. It yeah, and it just. Oh. Uh, so I'm, so, I'm kind of excited. I have a lot left. Beautiful. Yes, so. because you want to knit with this again because it's so nice. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure when we'll have that back I in the know. shop, but when when we can, we will. I think that that'll be one that I try to get every time it's here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's so nice. It's it's oh. It's just, it's, it's really good. It really, really is. It's and it was good before it was blocked. Yeah. yeah. And it was soft to knit with. Yeah. yeah. It Ugh. never, it never, I remember the first time I touched it. It was just like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and then you used a variety of yarns. I used a yarns. variety, Look yeah. Um, I know, it's so pretty. I love it. It's like a butterfly. Um, so the, the yellow, that greeny yellow, mm -hmm. um, the white and the peach are all woolly mammoth. They are skeins I've sort of collected over time. Like, nice. Oh, I'm just gonna just one of those. Yeah. And, one of those. and did you use very much of them in this? No, I still have gobs left. See. Um, and then the the teal, the blue there, blue green is black blacker cove. Yes, yeah, one of their yeah. birthday yarns. Black I think their cove. last one was that cove. I think that was. Or was it the year before? I think it was actually the year before. Okay. Um, I lose yeah. track. So gorgeous, gorgeous. And then you put on your edging, which I really I did. like. You know what was surprising? I loved doing the edging. I loved doing the edging. I couldn't believe how much I loved doing the edging. Mm -hmm. Like it took me about halfway through to go, oh, all right. And I, ha I had to look at the pattern. Left. Because I you knit the edging this way. Yeah. And so you are, are you, you're, you're as you you've got live you've got yeah. live stitches down here so you're binding off as you as you join two stitches together yeah 
yeah, I can't wait to get to this. This this is my. I I, I was surprised. This. The only I'd only ever done one other one, and it was a brioche shawl, which um, is a heavy <laughs> which lift. Which was, you know, I got to the I was I was foolish, and I got to the the edging of that one. I can bring it in and show it. It's yeah, a, it's a fun knit. Um. But I got to the edge of that one thinking, oh, I only have the applied edging. But it was a brioche edging. Uh -huh. And I'm not, I've only, that was the only brioche project I've done. I learned it just for that project. I've forgotten all I knew. <laughs> and um, I couldn't fix my mistakes. So uh, I had to be really deliberate. Of, very careful, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it was really slow. Well, this is plotting, beautiful. Beautiful. So. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Because today is the last day of the hemp cow. So yes. you finished in time. I did. And I think, have you, have you started another one? I haven't. I'm trying to clear my needles, but I'm I'm spinning for one. That's right. And I'm tempted to start another one in Jameson and Smith using a cone I have. So I'm trying to sort of pace myself. Like yeah. I need to clear some needles. But you know decisions. what? That center square or triangle is so mindless yeah. that it's great for travel knitting or, yeah. you know, just. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely be knitting another one. Yeah, I think. I think. Well, I yeah. really enjoy knitting them. So I don't have any FOs. I actually realized that um, I had big plans to finish my green victory for this yeah. week. Uh, but we're actually recording a little bit earlier than we need to, and I didn't get to it. So um, that'll have to be in the next time. Yeah. But I have been knitting on my whole full hansel. This is from a cone of Jameson and Smith 202. And the colors I have gone kind of pinky, reddy, orangey, bright. I love these. Do you like him? So I'm enjoying knitting with it. It's very spring-like and almost looking forward to summer as well with the hot colors. Let's I love see. that. I love that it looks like a big squishy bag at this point. It does. You know, um, can I ask, because we've seen some discussion about this, what yeah. size needle cord are you using? Do you know? Oh, um, this size. Is it a, maybe a 40 inch? That's not a 60. No, I don't think so. I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, I saw that. I mean, you. I think it's at least a 40. Okay. But 40 is enough. I think that's, that's just helpful is. like cuz when you see how big they are, yeah. It's you can you can start to think that you need the world's longest No. Needle. And I'm using my Chaigu um interchangeables and they are holding up really really well. Everything's staying nice and tight. I've had to tighten it once or twice, but that's uh, that's a lot of knitting. Yeah. Um I use them for the back and forth as well of the diamond and I think I'm getting close to the center. Piece. I do have to use stitch markers all the way around, otherwise I get lost. But yeah, so that's a corner here. With that many stitches, though, it's better to. It's know better early. to know because it can take you quite a while to get round. I'm at the maximum stitch count, but yeah, I think it's kind of pretty. I love it. I love those colors together. Yeah, me too. Me too. So um, we can put in the show notes what they are as well. I know yeah. a couple of people have been asking. I, yeah, I had a beautiful bouquet of uh, very spring hot color um, flowers at home. And that's what gave me the inspiration. And it's funny because I came into the shop on Saturday morning when no one was here. And I had a very good time to myself figuring out what colors I wanted. Yeah. So I yep. love that. I love too that taking the color inspiration from something like Jameson and Smith, they do that in their yes. Instagram. They'll yes. post a photo and then colorways. Yes. And um, it's, you know, it's genius. It's beautiful. I mean, talk about color therapy. Oh, and I'm using my lovely big bag here. Thank you. My um, hap cow bag. So, Maggie, have you enjoyed the hap cow? I love the hap cow. Um, so, like Karine said, we're recording a little early because. Uh, we have a long weekend coming up. Yeah. And I'm actually Memorial hoping, Day. I'm planning, part of my plans for the long weekend are yeah. to catch up on a couple interviews that I yeah. haven't had time to watch yet. Yes, um, yes. And just use that time to. Yes. Um, yeah, because they're all spin, out now. I'll probably get some spinning in. Well, that's good. Because I'd like to be able to start the body of the hap, but I at least want the main yarn done. That makes sense. Yeah, I think the hap cow has gone really, really well. I think it's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. People seem to have had a really good time. Yeah. It's been Friendly. There's lots of chat. It's amazing seeing all the, the haps. And everywhere. we're planning to leave the Hap Cal uh, group 
intact for a little while so that you can keep chatting while you finish off and we're going to leave the videos available to you for another three months mm -hmm. at which point we'll take them down but um yeah uh, and we'll warn you in email yes for sure <laughs> um but it's been a really fun experience i've really mm -hmm. enjoyed the chatter and all the photos and all the whips and all the fo's just it's gorgeous yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, my queue has gotten longer. <laughs> yeah. It happens with every, I every know. cow. Every cow. Goodness me. So let's see. Uh, let's go to your whip. So, I, you know what? I have another half FO. Oh. <laughs> are you getting ahead or are you behind? <laughs> I am behind. And a little bit ahead. So what's funny is I ha all I had to do was Kitchener this. It literally sat in a bag for two months waiting for the kitchener. just waiting for the kitchener the other one is already at the heel i had started them two at a time and i got really annoyed with the cord and both ends of the ball so i separated them and then just blasted through this one these look nice and soft they are this yeah. is by shosha spinners mm -hmm. that was last year's um christmas sock yarn yep i want to say vintage tinsel yep that's what it looks like it's yep. got the glitter in it yep yeah lovely and, uh, so who are these for they're for me <laughs> Nice. Nice. Quite right, quite right. Um, most of the, you know, my husband asks me that all the time. Who's that for? It's for me. <laughs> it's for me. Okay. Absolutely. What have you made for me lately? I know, right? <laughs> what are you but, working so hard on? Um, I do need to knit him some socks. And does he? Um, does, is he knit worthy? He, will, he is sock worthy. He's knit worthy, but he's also like he doesn't want to wear. He doesn't wear sweaters, so he's like just don't. Yeah. Spend the time and yeah. the effort. Um, probably he does wear hats. Yet I've not knit him a hat. Oh, um, you need to do that. Maybe I, I could probably do that. Um, Some black Welsh men. I know, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a good mm -hmm. one. Um, yeah. So long so, as he's not going to lose it. He wouldn't. I mean, like he's 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 good. He's, he's good, good like with that. Stuff. Yeah. Um, so I had a couple of for me. I had a couple of pairs of socks end up in the dryer since we last met. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's not good. Yep. Yeah. My husband. That's not good. Trying to help. Yeah. yeah. My husband, he, my husband, I, I think I've told you this. He's taken over the laundry um, and I've, I'm not stopping him. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm, you're not a fool. And, and I, I actually told him, I said, just so you know, I'm not thinking of laundry. So if you need me to, I can, I will, I'm jumping in, but tell me because I'm not, you've just got it. <laughs> um, so, um, but he does, he puts all the woolens aside Aww. and it, we have a bin like yeah. the washer dryer and they just all go in there Yep. and then I come and do that. Yeah. I like wash, I hand wash them and they don't go in there. I, I, I wash mine in the washing machine, um, but then they hang to dry. They yeah. don't go in the dryer. <sighs> So anyway, good thing I have small feet, but yes, lovely sock done. And I've been working on my vanilla fluff ah, again, ooh, fluff. So, which is why that's the other reason I haven't started another square oh, because I'm just going, going round and round. Oh my um, gosh. I know it's it. No, it's, it's gorgeous. Every, it so you know, much. Oh, I've got stitches coming off. There you go. Um, but they're yes. woolly. They just pop back. They off. do. It's not a big deal. Gorgeous. I love yeah. this. So, so this is the vanilla fluff in what color? Um, this is um, Rama Fennel Garn and... Rama Fennel Garn, it's 4120. It's been a while since I... That's 4120? It is 4120. And the fluff is 174. There is a kit for that. Yep. And it knits up beautifully. And it, then maybe you can show a close-up of yeah. the um, how it looks with it, that mohair in it. It does. The mohair gives it like... A sparkle shine. and yeah. sheen. The mohair is lighter. Uh-huh. Um, so in color. In lighter in color. So it does lighten it up a little bit. But that's fine. But I it love looks it. good. Looks yeah. really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is it, it, yes. You got to watch that. That you catch every mohair strand yeah. with the with the wool. I'll tap later. Yeah, you can uh, pop, pop it through. Yeah. Pop it through to the wrong side. Oh, that's going to look good on you. Yeah, I'm very mm -hmm. excited. So it's not too warm to knit that yet. No, I mean the. It, what was funny was the day I was finishing this. It was ninety degrees out. We had and some it was still weather. on my lap, and I had it to the side, and they were just kind of looking at me, and I'm like, I'm getting it done. <laughs> <laughs> and you just move it off your lap to the side, and yeah. you're fine. It's, it's not too hot. <laughs> Have some fine. ice water it's handy fine. to put your fingers in once in this a while. This is one of the. Per this is my season because I am always cold. Yeah. So. Yeah. Even the other day in in the office. Um, other people thought it was warm and I'm like, oh, that sounds right. Cause I'm just perfect. <laughs> That's right. That's right. 
So, uh, so that's, that's, that's good. What I do about. have another whip which I've started. It's not made a whole lot of progress. Progress. I went back in time there. Progress. Um, and this is a baby knit because I have another baby that I want to knit for. Oh. And what yarn are you using? This is Rowan Felted Tweed, which okay. we used to stock. I think there's a little bit left in the shop, but we're not going to reorder it because it just, you know, it's not a thing for, for the woolly thistlers, and that's okay. Um, we tried. So I'm using up some stash, and I'm just doing a, another moss stitch, two by oh, two. Nice. Yeah, and it, and it started with an I-cord cast on, huh. which, by the way, I really enjoyed. And I think I need to use this more often. I might use it as a little design element of my own in hmm. something like a neckline or something. Yeah, really fascinating. I had, yeah, yeah. doesn't it feel nice? Oh, that is nice. I do enjoy this yarn. It's, um, it's uh, from Rowan and it's got a little bit of alpaca and a little bit of viscose in it. And the rest is wool. Mm -hmm. And it's got all these tweedy colors in it. Yeah. Very nice. Yes. Yes. Lovely. And green because yes. I don't know if it's a boy or a girl and, and it doesn't really matter. Right. So going with green. So that's everything. I did just learn that one of my husband's co-workers is pregnant again. And I was like, oh, baby nets. Baby nets. Does yeah. that, do you like them, baby nets? I do. Do you they're, ever go to patterns? Um, I like to knit the baby surprise jacket. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've done that, too. I yeah. also really love, um, like, when our youngest, when Irene was a baby, um, I knit her Elizabeth Zimmerman's February baby sweater, where it has, it's, a, it's a garter yoke and then a lacy bottom. Oh, pretty. Um, yeah. I loved that. I, I put, she wore that baby sweater. What would you, what would you knit that in? I knit it out of wool. I mean. Yeah, but, like, is um, it a four-ply? I think so. Yeah. 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 Well, we've got plenty of choice. Yeah. Yeah. So fabulous. Baby nets are fun. Baby nets are fun. Um, is it time to go visit Rachel? I think it is. All right. Let's go visit Rachel. She has some answers to your questions and we'll see you when you come back and make sure you come back because we still have Caitlin and we have Rachel from Daughter of a Shepherd. And, and we, we have, have something really good to show you. And there's that too. So we'll see you in a minute. Hi, Willy Thistlers. It's Rachel from Barkland Craft here in Fair Isle. And thank you for joining me for another postcard from Fair Isle. As you can see, I've got some of the lambs and Scampi the cats here in the background. And I'll talk about them a little bit later in this video. <laughs> Thank you so much for the questions that you've been asking and I'll, um, I'll crack on and work my way through those now for you. So the first question comes from Catherine and she has asked, are there any bees on Fair Isle? And if so, are they wild or are they kept by beekeepers? And the second part of her question is, are you able to garden? Um, thank you for your, your questions, Catherine. There are bees on Fair Isle, um, but they're only wild bees. Um, the, the main one that, that we get is the Shetland bee. Um, and I'll try and put a, a picture of one of those here. Um, we don't, you can't really keep bees here. I, I would have really liked to have done that, had a, a couple of hives, but unfortunately the, the climate is such that, that bees just, just um, or bees that are kind of kept by people in hives just, just don't survive here. So, you know. And the second part of Catherine's question, am I able to garden? Yes, um, I'm not a very good gardener um, and I really only grow sort of a, a few varieties of vegetables. Uh, our growing season is at least a month behind the rest of the UK. Um, so there's nothing in the ground at the moment. We're on the, the 2nd of May uh, today as I'm, I'm filming this. Um, I do have some tomatoes and some salad leaves growing in pots inside. Um, and once the, the weather gets a bit better, um, they'll, they'll come outside. Uh, as you can hopefully see, we do have blue sky today. I think we have seen the sun on three days um, since my last video episode. Um, and as you can tell by the, the two jumpers, <laughs> spring hasn't quite arrived because it's still really windy and cold. My next question is from Amy and she has asked, do sheep recognise family members such as their parents, siblings or their children? 
uh, when they are grown? And also, do sheep have friends that they hang with in the herd? That's a great question. Um, yes, they, they do on, on both counts. Um, they, they do recognise their, their family members. Um, so Patchwork, my Suffolk Yao, who you met in the, the last video, um, and who's just there behind me. Um, she's one of my, she, well, was one of my very first caddy lambs, so hand-reared lambs. Uh, she went on to have Marigold, who I still have in the, the flock, and Marigold went on last year to have Tiny Lamb and Big Girl. Now, Tiny Lamb is a boy, so he lives in the, the boys' car, uh, park just over the, the, the wall. Um, but Big Girl um, is, after a year, kind of just living with the other year olds. She's back in with the in the Yow's field now, um, and she spends quite a lot of her time with her mum, Marigold. Um, she doesn't try to sort of suck from her, get milk from her, or anything like that, but they, it's obvious they, they do still have a bond. And when Patchwork is, is back in the field, uh, Marigold spends quite a bit of time uh, around her. Um, also, um, previous times where siblings have sort of come together. Uh, so when Ludo was in a few weeks back being treated for her foot, she could see her brother and sort of chat with her brother Lancelot through the fence. Um, and also a couple of years ago when Blossom went back out into the, or for the first time went out into the Owls field, um, she and her mum, little Miss Teddy Bear, um, immediately sort of recognised each other. Um, and it's the same with, with people as well. Apparently, uh, sheep can recognise human faces for up to two years, uh, which is great. And they do. The, the second part of, of that question, do, do sheep have friends or particular friends that they hang with in the herd? Uh, absolutely. They, they very definitely have their, their own um, sort of friendship groups with, within the herd, um, even though they'll generally move as a big group. So if you're feeding them or moving them from one field to another, they'll, they'll work together as that, that big group. But they do certainly when they're, they're kind of just left to their own devices in, in the fields, they'll see them moving from one place to another kind of in their, their smaller friendship groups. I have a question from Cara that quite a few people have asked is, how did Saucepan get his name? Um, well, I'll, I'll put some photos in uh, to try and uh, illustrate this as, as I'm talking. Um, so Saucepan was a lamb that I found Sorry, I've got lambs trying to eat the tripod. Um, saucepan was a, a lamb I found on the hill last year when we were doing hill rotor, and I'll, I'll talk about hill rotor in the, in a minute. Hello. If you can see, oh, he's running away now, but that's um, Flopsy's lamb, um, and he's the, the least timid of the, the five lambs that, that I have. Um, sorry, back to Cara's question. Uh, so yeah, saucepan um, I found on the hill last year. Uh, sadly, his, his mum had died, and he was he was just by his mum, barring and barring, and he could only have been two days old, if if that. Um, so he was very cold, wet, and, and very weak. So he came back with me uh, in in my rucksack, and. Um, was hand reared um, but it took um, quite a while for to get him used to sucking milk from a bottle um, and when I sort of have him for, for feeding him he'd, he'd try and suck on everything else he'd suck on fingers he'd suck on my nose he'd try and suck on my chin he'd try and suck on my cheek um, everything apart from the bottle so I kind of just took to calling him sucky lamb and um, and sheep are very very quick or well, lambs are very very quick to sort of learn their names I know that sounds sort of silly um, but if, if I go in the, the fields and I, I call a particular name that that sheep will sort of look up and when they hear it so they, they do learn their names very quickly um, and I kind of thought hmm maybe when he's a year two years three years old me going around the film fields rather shouting sucky lamb um, wasn't perhaps the best name for him but he needed something that sounded fairly similar to sucky lamb um, so that's how he got the name saucepan <laughs> hello that's um this one here is uh, one of patchworks lambs he's the, the little boy um, question from Ruth is, how do you keep the breed separated or do you crossbreed your sheep? Um, so when I first came here, 
Um, I had, uh, it was about 40 sheep um, that I sort of inherited with the croft. And they were a mixture of um, pure Shetland yows and a Texel ram and a handful of Shetland Texel cross yows. So for the first few years I was here, um, the Texel ram would go to all of those. Um, there, there wasn't any separation. Um, now I don't have my Texel ram anymore, I only have Shetland rams. And um, the yowls still all live together, so I still have, well, Patchwork, the, the pure Suffolk, um, and then I still have my handful of Shetland Texel crosses. So who can we see? The one this one, I'll try and point to, that is Flopsy. She is half Shetland, half Texel. And I can't quite see, but the one with her bottom poking out there, that is Patience. Um, and she is three quarters Texel, a quarter Shetland. Um, so they all, all of them live together in, in the Yow's field. Um, and then when it comes time for tupping, um, I just sort of put the crosses into a separate park um, so that the, the ram can only go to the, the Shetland yows that I, I want them to go to. My next question is from Julie and she says, I'd love to hear more about the shearing process. Local sheep in Pennsylvania were clipped this past month. When are the conditions right for this in Shetland? That's a really good question. Um, so I know it seems kind of from social media that sheep around the world are clipped at you know, various times. Um, here in Shetland, um, again, we're kind of about a month or so behind the rest of the UK in terms of when it gets warm enough to clip and when the sheep's coats are, are ready to be clipped. Um, so usually we, we'd start June time, at some point in June, um, and hopefully have them, them done by the end of July. Um, I'll put a, a short video in of me uh, clipping a sheep last year that most people here on the aisle just use hand shears, um, although there are a few people that do use the electric clippers as well. Uh, so it's quite a, a slow process to, to clip each, each sheep. Um, and as I have about 80 to do myself, it, um, it does take a good few weeks to, to get through them. My next question comes from Sue and she asks a really interesting question. Is there much dung from the sheep? Um, do you collect it and use it or compost it or just leave it to fertilise the croft? That's a really interesting question. Um, yes, as, as you can imagine, uh, there is quite a lot of dung that, that comes from the, the sheep. Um, in the bigger fields, so in the boys' fields and in the yow's fields, um, that's big enough areas that, that we would just leave it. I, I wouldn't you know, go around collecting that at all. Um, but you might be able to see, I'll try and spin this round in the garden and through the gate in the other side of the garden. Um, there are, um, it's, it's quite small areas. So every day or every couple of days, if I do have sheep in here during the, the lambing period, um, I do go around with an empty feed sack and, and pick up the, the poop. Um, and then that I will store for a couple of years till it's, it's rotted down. Um, and then that I, I can use on the, the garden. My next question is from JP Knits One, who says, I'd love to know more about what Rachel eats. I know nothing about Scottish food, and I would think her food would also be influenced by where she lives. That's a really interesting question. Um, I wouldn't say that we really eat kind of traditional Scottish food here. Um, yes, people make things like bannocks, um, but there's 
we're kind of limited to a point by a what the shop gets in um, and b you know anything else that we can grow on our own to sort of supplement that um, so the, the food I eat is, is very much just kind of food food I like um, it's not kind of feral specific food um, I'm not sure if there really is anything feral specific it's it's not Scottish specific um, I tend to make things in in big portions um, that I can then sort of portion up and freeze in the freezer for a, sort of like ready meals um, which is is great at lambing um, especially the the last few days where Blossom who oh, you can't quite see her there she is um, she's now uh, a day coming up two days overdue um, and because she's one of my special needs sheep I'm, I'm currently sort of checking on her probably every half hour in the daytime um, and every two hours through the night so uh, so yeah when it comes to kind of needing to eat something of an evening um, I don't really have the energy to be standing in front of the, the cooker for <laughs> great lengths of time so it's handy just to get something out of the uh, the freezer in the morning defrost it and, and shove it in the oven so I have something ready. The next question from M can, apologies, um, it's either MKROT1 or MCROT1, um, who says, could you take the time to show the roof styles of the house and barn? Um, that's a, the first part of the question. So I'll, I'll put some photos in here. So typically the, the roofs of the houses here are slate tiled um, and then outbuildings, buyers, barns, whatever, um, are uh, typically um, sort of corrugated metal uh, roofing. The next part of uh, their question is what type of hay is grown in the area? Um, so we don't really grow hay on Fair Isle. Um, we typically grow, well it's called silage here, but it's not actually silage, it's, it's what everywhere else calls haylage. Um, so that is we grow grass, um, we'll get a fertiliser put down in May, um, and then typically about July time that grass will all be cut. Um, it's then turned over a couple of times to, to let it dry very partially um, and then that's baled and wrapped um, to provide food for the sheep over the winter. Um, and the next part of the question is are they put in small square bales, large squares or round bales? Um, well here we only have one baler machine and that's a small round bale so I'll, I'll try and put a photo in here of, uh, of what that produces. is what, what kind of grain or pellets um, and I'll put a little link into one of my previous videos now where I, I talked about what we, we feed the sheep. Well the main thing they get fed is this uh, which is I think it's just called booster nuts um, it's basically a barley blend um, with some added extras in and then I mix in with that some of this which is um, shredded beet um, and that's just quite sort of tasty for them and then some of them if they're needing a little bit extra or they're needing encouraging to eat. Um, this is a, a coarse mix. Um, I think they call it crunch. Um, looks a bit like rabbit food. Um, and that's just a really kind of tasty extra treat that will encourage them to eat full of lots of yummy things. So that's the three main hard feeds that they get. And the final part of the question is, is the, oh, sorry, is the food produced on the island or shipped in? So there's no food 
apart from the the silage haylage um we we can't grow any of the hard feed for sheep here on the island so all that is is shipped in from from shetland um, and they in turn get it from from south and then my final question for this episode is from Anne, who says, where did you grow up and how often do you see your family? Um, well, I actually grew up on the east coast of England, um, a county called Lincolnshire, which is a, a very rural county. Um, it's also known for being very flat as well. So it's, it's quite like um, parts of Holland in that respect. Um, and I grew up in a very, very small village, um, or it was when I lived there, um, called Old Creek. And I lived there until I went off to university. And then how often do I see my family? Um, not very often, unfortunately. Uh, my mum lives in Australia with my, my stepfather and my sister lives with my brother-in-law, her husband, in Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. Um, so I think the last time I saw my mum and my sister was in 2019. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been a while. <laughs> um, but luckily, um, internet nowadays on the aisle is good enough that we, we can do uh, video chatting. So um, I message with my sister pretty much most days, um, and we kind of have a video catch up every once in a while. Um, and then my mum and I have a, a video chat sort of once once a week, which I, I really look forward to. One of the jobs I've been doing recently is fencing in a new area which will allow me to grow more grass to produce more silage bales to feed the sheep over the winter. It's hard to tell from the photos, but it's roughly 50 metres wide by about 80 metres long. Violet and Saucepan like to keep a close eye on things and after two half days we were done. We finally got a really lovely day on the 19th of April so in the evening I headed down to the beach to have a wander. It was a really low tide and quite a lot of the hill sheep were down eating the seaweed and you can see here there's a yow teaching her two lambs which bits are the good bits of seaweed to eat. On North Haven which is the sandy beach I came across this dead fish I sent the photos to a few friends on the aisle and they said it's called a lump sucker fish and apparently that sucker underneath it attaches it to rocks so it can withstand really stormy sea conditions although I still think it looks like it's got a pair of false teeth underneath it. I then went up to the area just around North Light and spent some time watching the puffins which I thought you might enjoy seeing. We hope you enjoyed that segment with Rachel. Uh, I love that she takes the time to go through I know. comments and answer your questions. Yes. And she's just always wonderful. Yeah. Uh, if you didn't see Rachel in our la her last segment, uh, go back and check it out. She sh shared her lambs and lambing with us, and it was just adorable. To it was adorable. Around. And many, many, many people were asking after Blossom, and uh, Blossom is doing great. She had a healthy lamb, and she's a great mom. And I think that um, Rachel's working on helping Blossom's legs get back to normal, back to being strong. So 
Yeah, there was an outpouring of love for for Pretty Blossom. Yeah. So yes, she's she's got the best mum there in Rachel. So yeah, and um, this video of Q and A is from a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So that's why she doesn't maybe address that um, there. But uh, I know that she's tickled to know that so many of you are watching her progress and rooting her on. So that's great. Yeah. yeah. So um, and I'm sure we'll hear more. And we will hear more. Yeah. Yes. For sure. So what is next, Maggie? Oh, taster boxes, update. Oh, yes, spring taster boxes. Thank you so much um, for your outpouring of support. Taster yep. boxes did very well. They did. They have sold out. Yes. And they are shipping and should be in your hands very, very soon. They sold out during the early access portion. Yeah. Uh, which we've never had that happen before. So thank you very much yeah. for, for um, showing up and doing that. We know you're gonna love them and uh, a lot of time and effort Effort, went into making them so we do hope that you love them very much and thank you so much for shopping with us for them so um we will have another taster box probably around the holiday season yep. so that'll be the next one. we already have some irons in the fire for that so that's exciting and it does take a long time to make them happen and pull it together so we're already yeah. working on the next one which we know you'll love because we, we do what we love right yeah yes so okay so what is next then so now quickly we're headed over to see Caitlin, who is furthering her fleece exploration. And again, we had a lot of comments from people wanting to know more about that. So she's ready to show you. And make sure you come back because we still have to talk to Rachel of Daughter of a Shepherd. And we have something very exciting to mm -hmm. show you as well. So we'll see you after Caitlin. Hello, nice to be back with you again. My name's Caitlin. And today I have a couple of things to share with you. Um, today is the last official day of our Hap Knit Along, so I have the, the Hap I've been working on to show you. And then I have the next step in my fleece processing to show you. Last time I was here, episode 169, I showed you the raw fleece that I got recently and the steps that I took to wash that. Now today I have the next step, which is carding kind of the brushing and combing of the fibers to get ready for spinning. So uh, today I'm wearing the Atlee Tee. This is by Leah Tibbalt. And it's knit in a DK weight. Let's put back. Um, just kind of a A-line tee, something for summer. Mine's knit in a uh, wool cotton blend that I had in stash, but um, anything DK would work. I'm trying to get in some of my summer knits before it gets even too hot for, for some of these, some days. Uh, so I wanna show you my hap. I've been working on one of the Hansel haps by Gudrun Johnston, and I'm making the half size, which is a triangle, rather than the full size, which is a square. And then there's three sizes in that. I'm doing the medium. So that's the same as what Maggie is doing, I believe. And you can see here how far I'm getting. I'm just over halfway done with the colorwork stripes. So I think it's turning out pretty nicely. I'm knitting mine in Jameson and Smith yarns. The main color is Shetland Supreme, which is very similar to the two ply jumper weight, but it's their undyed kind of natural color blends. And this is 2006. And then I've got Jameson and Smith jump, uh, two ply jumper weight for the colors. This is 121, FC 11, uh, 002, and 29. I've got those in the ball for you to see. There they are. It was so hard for me to choose colors, but I like how these are turning out. I was a little bit intimidated by the lace because I don't have a whole lot of um, lace experience and I'm also frequently interrupted in my knitting, but it's been going really well. It's mostly just garter, so it's knit on the front, knit on the back. And then just every, once every six rows, there's a row of some yarn overs and some slip slip knits and knit two togethers. I also put markers for every repeat 
of the lace. So if I get off, I'm hopefully not off by much and can go back easily and find the mistake. And that's been a lot of fun. So if you have joined in on the happy along, I hope that you really enjoyed it. And if you haven't, um, you can do the hap anytime. And I highly recommend that one as a starter project. And uh, yeah, let us know um, what you're working on. So now I want to share the next step in my wool processing. Last time I shared that I got a Tunis fleece from our local Living History Museum. They just happened to be skirting a fleece and gave me some. So last time I showed how to how I go about just basically washing it and then um, showed kind of how clean and nice it got at the end of that. Now uh, today I'm going to talk about how I prepared it for spinning. So this is a lock of that fleece. The fibers are all still in the same line. What I could of the fleece, I would just grab a lock that was still kind of um, intact enough to be able to grab onto. And I just took my dog's sort of paddle bristle brush and flicked out the uh, ends on one side and then I grabbed it and did it on the other. I did what I could uh, of that until the rest of it was just kind of a jumbled mess and I couldn't grab any nice locks, but I think these turned out great. It mostly got the vegetable matter, hay pieces and bedding stuff out of it. And I think these are looking pretty great. Um, technically I could take these and spin right from these. And, um, I would have kind of a worsted yarn in that case. Worsted preparation and spinning is when you keep all of the fibers as in line as possible and then you spin them that way. Worsted style spinning is where you have quite a lot of control over how much spin goes into your yarn, to your fiber as you're making the yarn. Um, the opposite of that, the other side of that is woolen preparation and spinning and woolen spinning something I haven't learned how to do yet is when you let the twist in sooner so it gets more air trapped in there and the fibers are kind of all jumbled around because of the preparation so the rest of what I've prepared is woolen style preparation because I used a drum carter and um, so I'm going to show you a video we'll put in here in a moment of my drum carting <laughs> sort of experience with the rest of this fiber. And I'll kind of walk you through what I did. So here we go. Uh, so I have a classic Carter. These are handmade in Shropshire, Shropshire in the UK. And it's a very basic style drum Carter. Um, it, they talk about the carding cloth, which is on the big drum uh, as how many tines per inch it has. Mine has 72, so within an inch square, there's 72 little bristles, uh, which is a pretty standard size. So what I've done here is just lined up some of the fiber, kind of loose, fluffy fiber onto the tray. And then I turn the crank, which um, causes both of the drums to spin, and it pulls the fiber in through the small wheel and then up onto the larger, the larger drum. So the goal is to kind of open up all of the fibers, uh, remove a little bit of the vegetable matter, and then um, what you're left with at the end is called an art bat, or a, a bat of fleece. Art bats are when um, you put a lot of different fibers in there. Um, so now I'm taking what's called a doffer, that's the metal tool, and there's a little groove on one spot of the cylinder to be able to run the doffer along and split the fiber off so that you can pull it off of the, the cylinder. The smaller uh, drum there has caught some of the smaller bits of fiber, uh, which will help avoid a lot of discrepancies and kind of slubs and texture in the final yarn those uh, little shorter fibers will happen in the shearing process when uh, the shearer has to go back and do kind of some shorter second cuts, they're called. And there I was just taking an actual porcupine quill, which is a tool that comes with the carter and helps kind of remove some of the, the smaller little bits. 
um, that gets stuck on the carding cloth. So there I'm removing the bat and in a moment you'll get to see what one pass through the drum carter looks like. Now drum carter is a step up in fiber preparation from hand cards, which you may have seen before. Um, those are a very hand <laughs> um, powered. Uh, oh, here you can see all of the vegetable matter that fell out underneath and that finished first pass of the bat. So then what I did is I split that bat down in the in half lengthwise and kind of teased it back out again and now I'm running it through a second pass. I've sped this up a bit so you can um, just kind of get the feel for what a second pass will look like. It's going to take two segments of the fiber to get all of that back on. I'm doing a little bit of picking out of big vegetable matter, making sure the fiber doesn't get stuck around the edges. And some of these smaller ones I'll remove, some I might try to get back onto the bat. Um, so hand cards, going back to that, um, are kind of the, the most basic way to prepare fiber. And you'll see just two um, kind of paddle brushes, wooden with wooden handles that uh, you just kind of pass the fiber back and forth between. Uh, a drum carter is kind of a, a step up from that as far as how much um, muscle it takes. <laughs> now here I have what's called a flicker brush, which uh, I would usually use if I'm really loading up the drum. I can hold about two ounces of fiber on this drum, but you have to kind of pack it down every once in a while to, um, to get that much fiber to fit on. So you take that brush to kind of compact it down if you're going to be adding more. Now here I'm removing the bat again, and you can see when I hold it up that it will have gotten a little bit smoother, a little bit more um, jumbled together. Some of the vegetable matter will have fallen out and it's starting to look a little bit more consistent. And then I'll run it through one more pass. And here you can see the fibers are not necessarily all facing the same direction. I have not fed them in in any methodical way, really. Um, it just makes a nice, really fluffy, pillowy um, bat. So I'm sending it through one more time to kind of even out some of those spots and maybe remove a couple other shorter sections. And um, depending on how much you want your fiber blended or how rough and textured you kind of want it, you can send it through as many passes as you want. Um, so here you'll see my finished bat. And um, what I'll do next is strip this down into sections and then kind of tease that fiber out a little more and spin it. So here is the finished bat. All, all prepared for spinning. <laughs> So oh, I have that also here to show you what kind of I ended up with here. There's still quite a bit of vegetable matter. That seems to be my story every time. It's not as clean as maybe I would like it to be. But again, for something that was not necessarily intended to be um, made into a fine yarn to begin with, and this is some heritage sheep from a local farm that are not raised primarily for fiber. They aren't, you know, spending the year covered in coats that will keep their fleece nice and clean. Um, they're, they're rolling around in the dirt. <laughs> and, you know, that gives the yarn a bit more of its story too. I know some of us don't mind the sheepy smell, the little bit of vegetable matter that shows the sheep had a happy life um, in the year that it was producing this fleece. But um, I'm not sure yet if I'm going to combine this carding, uh, the bat with the stuff that I kind of flicked open and got a little bit cleaner. I might keep those separate just to see. I don't have big plans for this yarn, so it's really just going to be, um, seeing what I get at the end. And I wanted to show you a couple other uses for a drum carter, um, because it's just a lot of fun to play with. Uh, if you want to blend different kinds of fibers or maybe different colors together, uh, this is a bat that I did uh, a while ago on my carter. This was four ounces of um, wool top. I don't know what breed of wool. 
but I, I dyed it in little segments of color and then I didn't end up really liking how the color progression ended up. And also I'd kind of almost felted it a little bit in my attempts at uh, acid dyeing. So I used the carter to kind of tease those fibers back open again. And I took some of the colors that I liked and I blended them together into this bat. So this is about two ounces now of, of um, blended colors, which is something fun to use the, the carter for. So I'll just kind of strip this into sections and then spin from here, um, kind of from the end there. And um, I wanted to com compare this, which has the fibers running all different directions, kind of jumbled up, with the other type of fiber preparation that you'll find from commercially prepared yarn, which is um, worsted prepared um, combed tops. And this is Yarnadelic tops from John Arbin, which is one that we sell in the shop. And these you can see the fibers are all sort of lining, um, lined up in the same direction. And they kind of all pull together, um, hold together really nicely compared to the bat where your fibers are, are um, still wanting to kind of travel together, but they're facing all different directions. And I'll just show you one more bat. This is uh, not one that I did, but this is what I would call an art bat. And this was done by Melanated Boho Bay. I uh, went to an event around Rhinebeck and she was vending there. And this is a beautiful art bat that she made. I think she has a larger carter than I do, but this is an example of blending silk noil. And she's got, this is even like some thread in here. There's some sparkle stuff, there's some wool, there might be some silk or some alpaca. There's, yeah, sparkly stuff on this side. Really fun. Um, so this is another fun way to kind of blend on a drum carter. So stay tuned. Hopefully next time I'll have some spinning to show you. And I hope you enjoyed that little uh, example of what types of fiber preparation there are and the uses for a drum carter. And uh, let us know if you've done some of this kind of experimenting in your uh, playing with fiber. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks. Well, we hope you enjoyed that. And also Caitlin was sharing her progress on her hat, which is just lovely, isn't it? It is, it's mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah, and they're so big. They're actually, I think Gudrun's done a great job of increasing the size of them. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're big. I so, love to have, depending on what colors you choose, it's just, it's looks so, so fun different. to see how. Yeah. How yeah. it changes things and yeah. it just always looks so pretty. Yes, indeed. So let's have a quick chat about what's uh, what's currently in the shop that we want to share with people. And first up, we've got Kate Davies's Argyle Secret Coast book, which has been doing fabulously. And yeah. we have it yeah. down there. Gorgeous book, as always, full of essays from experts about the area that this was written about, as well as Kate's beautiful patterns. Yeah. I like that. I know. That's it's a really pretty. quick and easy knit, I would think. Yeah. I think last time I was going on and on about the hat that I really liked. It turns out the hat is not, like, you can see she's wearing it there. It's, it's not, not, it's in, not there? in this book. Oh, it's, no. Um, like, you can get it on Ravelry. Okay. Um, and all you the patterns that. in here are really beautiful. Yep. Um, but... I love the color Small work. Correction. Um, the articles in here. Yeah. Yeah. Really fascinating. Um, she does such a good job yeah. always. So we have that in stock right now. And Radical Threads second issue is just out and we have this. I think that's lovely. Yeah. And that is crochet if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. Yeah, right? that is yeah. crochet. Yeah. So Radical Threads too. And again, it has many patterns in it. I'm not sure exactly how many. This just um, came in, so I haven't I want to say look. 11, but I could be wrong. It does list it on the product page mm -hmm. um, in the shop. Oh, I like the size of their type as well. I know, yes. Uh, especially Easy reading. <laughs> as I've now officially been put in bifocals, uh -oh, I appreciate there you this go. more and more. There you go. Um, yeah, yeah, it's great. There's also recipes in here. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> and we were flipping through in the shop the other day and we were all like, ooh, that looks really good. That looks really good. <laughs> we must have all been really hungry. Hungry, but looking yeah. at their beautiful photos and recipes. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's very tantalizing. It's a lovely issue. Yeah. Um, I need to spend some time looking through it properly yeah. myself. So, yeah. yeah. Great. Copies are in the shop now. And we also have a pre-order going. Is this the only pre-order we have right now? Uh, Shetland Wool Adventures Journal? Um, Pom Pom is also on pre-order. And Pom Pom. So Shetland Wool Adventures Journal number four. Mm -hmm. The cover is phenomenal as usual. Very moody and I love it. Yep. And uh, so we don't have that to show you because it's a pre-order and that's arriving in July. Yep. And when does Pom Pom come in? Put me on the spot. I want to say before July. Pom Pom comes in way before July. Yeah. I want to say it comes out in June. Okay, so that's on pre-order as well. So those are a couple can, of things. We can put the actual date Pom Pom releases here. Do we want to show Grady's? We do. So Grady is um, going to come on an episode in the near future to show us her object, but um, her son had COVID, so she's wearing a mask all the time, and uh, he, all is well, all is good. Yeah. So she asked us to show um, her progress so far, but she's knitting yeah. the vanilla sweater she in... Is. In the new Wool Dreamers... Um, Merino. Is it Barrera de Hesa? Yeah. Um, I'm to make sure I didn't... De Hesa Barrera. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that didn't quite sound right. Um, so I don't know if you want to yeah, hold those. For sure. um, so yeah, this is just beautiful. So it's uh, Spanish merino, yep. non super wash. Yeah. And um, Grady was totally smitten with it when it came in. And I love that she changed up the neckline. She must have cast on the neck and just uh, got straight into the body from there. Actually, is, no, she did. Did she, she pick up? She picked up. Yeah. Oh, she just got the neck done out of she the way. She just got what it done and out of the way, yeah. yeah. So. so this yarn is lovely, isn't it? It's non-superwash, 100% merino yeah, from Spain, gorgeous. España. So this is all one skein. Oh, wow. And she's almost to the end of the skein, but right. I, I confirmed with her that this is just one skein. Yeah. So that's amazing. Yeah. Um, she'll get maybe done in three. Yeah, I think she said she, she's yeah. estimating she'll need three. Wow. So, so yeah, lovely um, colors. Yes, it looks really nice. The um, Manchalope has been incredibly... Really popular. Yeah. So yeah. we'll try and get more of that in soon. Definitely. Um, most of the colors, I think, are sold out, but I'm not sure. Yeah, there might be like a little bit left. Here or there. Um, so. And this too has been popular. You've been buying this, but um, the Manchalope just like flew, which which is great. Um, we, we had a feeling that the unspun would be um, our jam. Yeah. Yeah. But um, this is too. These are lovely and very wooly it merino. Is, it's really tempting. Yeah. I, I got to say all this hack knitting really makes me kind of want to. It's it's gotten me back in the bug of shawls. Oh, yeah. Um, I used to do a lot of shawl I know, knitting. And I know. Sort of, I, then I got focused on sweaters. Garments. And, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, yes, hopefully maybe next episode. Do you see a shawl Brady, in that? I could totally see a shawl in this mm -hmm. yarn. It's been very tempting. Yeah. Um, okay. It's all very tempting. So Maggie, what's coming to the shop? Because we're super stoked about this. I am super stoked about this. Mm -hmm. Our socks bag <laughs> is coming to the shop. And it's right up there. Have oh. the eagle-eyed amongst you spied that? That we have a new... Uh, do you want to grab them? Yeah, I'll Your knees are further in than mine. So we have a couple here. Yes. Oh, yes. So I'm going to grab them all. Okay. This is this year's sock bag. And we went with a bigger bag that would actually fit the yarn in it, which is nice. And you can see our lady there is hanging up her socks to dry. There's a little basket of socks. And there's our sheep. And a chicken, of course. <laughs> I just love it. It's so cute. <laughs> it's very, very cute. It actually looks like she laid an egg, but I don't think that's what it's meant to be. But... I think it's just a I little bit of grass. grass. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's gorgeous. Gorgeous, gorgeous. So, and it's in this really nice tote bag. Yeah. I love the size of this tote bag. Yeah, it's good. It's really good. It's really good. Sort of in between size. Good. Yeah. yeah. I love it. So, Maggie, um, are we going to show them what's in the sock bag we this are year? We're going to show them. What is this going on sale, first of so all? So, this is going on sale. Oh, hang on. June 17th. June 17th. June 17th. That's okay. a Friday. But are we doing an early access sign up we for this? We are doing an early access. So starting today, you can sign up, go to the shop and sign up. There'll be a link in the show notes and you can sign up for early access. And which we recommend. Which we do recommend. Um, we were not able to sell any taster boxes generally because early access people got them. So yeah. that's, that's what you need to do. And it's very easy. You just sign up. 
Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. we'll tell you where and when. Yeah. Okay, so what is in this beautiful bag? So this bag, like last year's, has enough yarn for four pairs of socks. Right. Four different yarns. Four different yarns. So let's see. Um, shall we start with... And they're four different yarns from last year. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so this is a whole new set of yarns. So I'm going to start with Mondim. Uh, from Retrosaria Rosa Plamar with that awesome label. So you will get a skein of this. Maggie, are they all these? They are. We went with all the, so Mondim comes in an amazing array of colors, but we picked, um, I think it's like four to six uh, different varieties and they're all speckly and stripey uh, and colorful. Yes. So, so there's that. That's in there. And this is 100%. Portuguese wool, mm -hmm. non-superwash, yes. uh, spun with a nice twist. And this always, I always like the feel of this. It feels really substantial. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen, I know it is, this is good for socks. Yes. Like, so I don't know if you've not knit with 100% wool, wool sock yarn before, um, it holds up. Yeah. Um, and it's wonderful. It's not just for socks. So if you're like, I yep. don't really knit socks, but... Um, you could still knit with this. I've seen Absolutely. lots knit with this. But Absolutely. He's a gorgeous sock. Yeah. So there's that. Maggie, why don't you pick one? I'm going to show... Mm -hmm. oh. Rama Vandre. Yep. And you get three balls. You get three balls. This it, is a worsted weight yarn. Yep. <clears throat> it it says, is, is there sock yarn? Mm-hmm. Or a sock yarn? And it is 100% Norwegian wool. Yeah. In your bag, you're going to get two main color and one contrast color. So you can do alternate color work, toe and heel color work. Um, so for the average foot size, you'll need at least three balls. Right. These are 50 gram balls yep. and you'll need three of them for, yes, like you said, Maggie, for the average size pair. And yeah, so you will be able to do um, a lot of, do you, yes, you, you will need to do some element of color work to make it depends what size your feet are yeah. like i have pretty small feet i actually finished a pair with two okay but yeah it depends yeah, what you size can, your feet are you this can way do heels and toes choice. and that will help yeah. yeah so there's that um again this is 100 percent wool norwegian wool so no nylon on in here and it's a worsted weight so it's nice and sturdy and the norwegians have been knitting socks with this for a long long yeah. time yeah so they make lovely socks and then, shall I show the next one? Yeah. Oh, we have Jagger's very own Musum Falls sock yarn. And this here is a 100% superwash wool. Again, no nylon. Yeah. Gorgeous. And this one comes in all kinds of bright springy Loads colors. Loads of bright springy colors in this one. And it feels gorgeous this this is very very soft and lovely worsted spun good for socks and again you don't have to use it for socks yeah make a nice like shawl so we have lots of different <coughs> colors in this and that will be in your bag as well yeah and then maggie what is the fourth one so the fourth one is, is crazy really special mm -hmm. this is so exciting <laughs> Is from Daughter of a Shepherd. Daughter of a Shepherd has a sock yarn. It's called Drover and it's brand new. And we are launching it in our socks bag. It is amazing. Yeah. So this sock yarn actually comes in three natural shades. The third one is um, it's not here right now. And we're actually still waiting for our order to arrive. It's on its way. Um, but isn't that gorgeous? It's her Hebridean wool made into a sock yarn. And we'll have lots more to share about this. But this is extremely, extremely special. Yeah. Yes. This one does have 10% of nylon in it. Right. So this has a 90-10 split with a little bit of nylon just to just to help yeah. with the durability, which is a good thing. Spun at John Arbin. So he knows what he's doing. Yeah. He is the purveyor of Exmoor sock yarn, of course. And once again, I wish we could do smell -O vision Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. It is really, really lovely. It really is very special. 
and uh yeah we're looking forward to that yeah. oh my god when that arrives <coughs> let me be there for the box opening so that we can oh, shove yeah. our faces yeah, yeah, yeah. in there and we'll film it when the boxes arrive yeah um and so we'll have more information for you like we'll be able to show you more of the skeins and stuff in the next episode when yes. they arrive but we didn't want to not we didn't want to not amazing. tell you that we have on. this amazing yeah. So I think this sock bag as a whole is um, very, very good and interesting. We've Amazing. got um, the only nylon is in the Daughter of a Shepherd and it's 10%. Yep. The rest of it is all 100% wool. Yeah. And um, yeah. Got yes. Another, oh, you got a green color. one. Yeah. 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 So, and we'll be careful with the colors. I'm just showing it. Yes. yes. So, so you trust us when you buy a socks bag. You trust us to pick the colors. Yeah. But we promise we'll do a good job. Yes, we will. So um, that's all the yarn in the bag. And there's a couple of other little goodies mm -hmm. in the bag too. Yeah. You'll get a couple of stickers with the nice. sock bag image. I love these. Yes. Um, and a set of darning needles. Wonderful. So those also come in the bag. These will be going on sale. Well, June, June 17th. 17th. Um, but those of you who sign up for early access will get that before then. Mm -hmm. And um, we yeah. hope you're as excited as we are. We really, really love this. I think it's so cute. And the yarns are amazing. Fair. And you'll get to knit with a worsted weight. And the other four are, or the other three are fingering weight. Yeah. 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 And we also include a pattern card that has suggestions, pattern suggestions for each of the yarns yes. included. And we try really hard to include free patterns and pay for patterns yep. a mix so that you can just get that free pattern and go for it yeah yeah lovely 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 so, so yes i know i know i we've been yes. planning these for a while so yes it's nice to finally i know to talk about get it. them out into the world <laughs> i know i know not much longer now so i think without further ado then we should head off to our interview with rachel but before we do that we should announce another winner that's right because yes. We didn't do that so why don't you do that okay um our winner is julie knits in the woods Hooray. she says thanks for another great podcast i'm taking emma's suggestion to heart to explore different yarns with the same pattern i'm curious about using jagger spun with kate davies pattern treat 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 i guess treat from inkling i love that word mm -hmm. um i just received my copy in the mail so i'm ready to swatch loved rachel's lambing segment what a treat i hope blossom came through delivery she did she did she did yeah well thank you very much uh julie knits in the woods um yeah so email us at info at the woolly thistle and put prize winner in all caps in the subject line and we will get your prize to you yes happy to do that and of course remember if you want to be in the running for a prize next time leave us a comment Leave us a thumbs up. And the, subscribe. And subscribe. And there's a plane taking off. So before we go, I just want to say enjoy the episode with Rachel. We'll let her take us out. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to her on the show. It's her first time doing an interview with us. And uh, hopefully many more to follow. But anyway, uh, enjoy that. And until we see you again, if you go out, take your knitting. Bye. Hi everyone, I am really excited to welcome Rachel Atkinson of Daughter of a Shepherd. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Woolly Thistle, Rachel. We've been selling your yarns for a little while, but it's really great to have you on, on the episode so that you can tell us all about your business and your yarns and your mission. So welcome. Oh, thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> and having all my yarns as well. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you have a great backdrop there and I hope we get to talk about all of it. Um, maybe you could, uh, Introduce yourself by telling us about Daughter of a Shepherd, how it got started. Um, that would be really interesting for folks to know. Sure. Um, it's, I started back in about 2015. Um, I am the daughter of a shepherd, um, but my dad was a, he originally, as we were growing up, he originally um, had sheep for training his border collies on, which was a hobby that he had alongside his work, which was as a lingerie salesman um, and he kept Suffolk's uh, and they just grazed different places around the village um, and he'd just train his dogs on it and as the years went by um, he got more and more into his shepherding and his dog trialing and uh, and such like and decided to leave the the retail business behind um, and then he was approached by Eskrit Park Estate, which is a large, well, it's it's a large estate just outside York in North Yorkshire. Right. 
Um, Because you're a Yorkshire girl, yes. I am, I am, I am a proud Yorkshire girl. Um, um, He he was approached by them, they have a nature reserve Mm. and were used as um, by, I think it was by rural England, who were testing conservation, different breeds of sheep, cattle and horses for conservation grazing. And it was... What what does that mean, conservation grazing? Mm, Sure. So conservation grazing is an, it's a natural way of maintaining um, areas of land um, rather than having to go in and uh, dig by foot or treat with chemicals or it's it's sort of like more of a gentle way of looking after areas. Because the sheep can go in and the sheep go in and they, they basically eat what's not wanted as much as anything and absolutely yeah they'll pick up any small uh, silver birch saplings mm-hmm. they'll eat their way through those so so the birch doesn't overtake all the other trees okay. and, and such yeah. like and um i think it was about 100 sheep had been released into this huge nature reserve yeah and um then they couldn't work out how to get them back so they were like, okay, well, now gone. We can sit, we can spot a few every now and again, but how do we get them in to check them? That's funny. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We hadn't thought the whole way through. No, it had definitely had. <laughs> I never do that. <laughs> so what See, happened then? I ended up here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So they, they called in, uh, they called in support in the form of your dad, who was. Yeah, yeah, he got a phone call. It was via somebody and mm-hmm. um, and turned up with his dogs and, and gathered these sheep oh, in. Yeah, and was, was offered a, a job as the, the shepherd. And um, he he was he's worked there for quite a number of years. He re, he retired. I think it was last year. He he was like, no, I'm getting to an age now where I can't keep doing this. But yeah. Um, and he, was, was this still Suffolk at the time or had it gone to Hebridean at that point? It was all Hebrideans, yeah. Okay. And he'd been, he'd been um, I think that they approached him, he'd already started breeding Hebrideans. He'd moved on from the Suffolks and, and breeding okay. the Hebrideans. He's now breeding Hebrideans himself, which was the connection between right, right. the Republic of State and him. Okay. Through, I think through the Breeders Society or the Vets yeah. or something. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, so he had his own small flock and Eskrit Park Estate had their bigger flock. Um, and they kept the Hebrideans and then they bred them and the flock, I think it was, it was around 300 and going up to about probably 400, 450 during lambing. Wow. So it was a fairly large flock. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So your dad did that. He was the, the official shepherd for the, for the park and he was able to get all these sheep back in and would that be for lambing and for clipping and you know general care or yeah yeah yeah, just sort of to do health checks on them um and then for topping and lambing uh, the Hebrideans will lamb out they lamb outside anyway but um, they're brought into smaller more enclosed areas so they're easier to care for and keep an eye on if there's any problems Yeah. So, and during all this, you were knitting, crocheting, um, just as a regular knitter, you hadn't, uh, you weren't, were you doing anything in the knitting field before you started this? Yeah, I'd, um, I'd been in retail and I was, I was working, originally working for Loop in London Mm -hmm. and alongside uh, tech editing for different magazines and independent designers, publishers such like so that that was my main work but um as a knitter and somebody in the knitting industry yeah I'd sort of see the sheep and be like I'd quite like to knit with their fleece maybe one day (laughs) and because there wasn't anything on the market probably at all um there 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 is people putting Hebridean out there Mm -hmm. on quite on smaller scales um but I, th- I thought it could be something more. They'd had their check through from the wool board for the the clip, the estate clip, mm-hmm. uh, which had valued the fleeces at approximately three pence each. So, which is that's nothing. Yeah, that's, nothing. that's yeah, that's terrible. 
Yeah, and it was costing, I think it was costing 120 to clip each sheep at that time as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, the shearers don't like clipping hairbrid ends either. They're quite an angular sheep and quite bony underneath. So they so, probably, you have to be more careful. Yeah, it takes a bit longer and they can't get as, they can't work as quickly. So, right, right. Interesting. So, not a desirable, not a desirable fleece in the eyes of the wool board or, you know, just the conventional industry. Um, what led you? I mean, obviously you were disgusted at the price, but what led you from sort of thinking that on the side to actually starting your own yarn company? What happened in between? How did it work? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I should should say that the Hebrideans are the sheep that's behind you on yes. the front of the book. Right um, here. Yeah. Yes, that's it. So they have this, they have a really dark fleece. So which is one of the reasons that the value is quite low because you can't dye black fleeces for so commercially they're not the most valuable sheep. <laughs> well look at that face. <laughs> one of the best pictures out there. So cute. <laughs> and they're <laughs> they're from the North Atlantic short tail. I, I don't know if the word is breed or if it's a bigger pool than that, because Shetland sheep belong to that same group as well. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, I think, I think so. Yeah, I'm a bit. Um, Me a bit too. With all the sheep breeds, but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they're lovely. They're lovely little sheep. They must have yeah, small lovely. fleeces. They are. Yeah, they're quite a small. They are quite a small sheep, a very hardy. Mm -hmm. um, really easy to look after which I think was one of the things that attracted my dad because uh, yeah some breed some breeds do need a lot more attention yeah, yeah. um and uh, so I'd seen I I'd, I'd seen this fleece and um that had this check and then I went off to visit um a Norwegian friend on the island of Gotland and we visited some markets and farms and in the farm shops you'd find eggs and meat and such like and you'd also find the spun skein of yarn that you could buy and then you could meet the sheep like literally they were next to where the shop was oh that's brilliant yeah yeah it was just like the whole connection between product and place and yep. what you're yep. holding in your hand and it, it makes so much sense and we don't do enough of it in the UK well and we probably weren't doing much of it at all back when this was which was you know 2015 ish or maybe a wee yeah, bit it was a while ago there's a few small there was a few small farms that had their own um, yeah their own label world but yeah it wasn't it, it's certainly become a much bigger thing having yeah you know, these these breeds well i think you helped make it the movement it became which was you know place-based mm -hmm. yarns and you know knowing the provenance of where that knitting yarn uh, is coming from so you went to Norway with a friend or to visit a friend you saw in their farm shop which I love I want a farm shop now <laughs> the <laughs> eggs and the meat and maybe some milk and some yeah and cheese <laughs> cheese yeah anything they could sell anything that came off the farm would basically yeah. be in the shop and and the wool and the wool, and, the wool. So, and did you buy the wool when you were in Norway did you buy some yarn while you were there I did. I did. I um. I picked up quite a few bits and pieces. Of course pieces. you did. Yeah. Of course you did. So is that what sort of set up the light bulb in your mind? Of yeah. It was that was that was the connection with this low value placed on the fleece. Me wanting to be a knitter, and then I was like, well, why can't we do this? So I got back home and um, I spoke to my dad, and we we chatted to the estate owner, and I I bought that year's clip that wow. um. That was sitting in the barn doing nothing yeah so um i all roads kind of eventually led me to john arban textiles in devon yep. who agreed to spin for me yep. and um i mean i must say i had I had a vague idea of how spinning production worked in the uk but um it did take quite a bit of asking <laughs> around and visiting yeah. and yeah yeah <laughs> doing research yeah yeah but you ended up with John Arbin who is an excellent uh spinner and mill so and it, but they're worsted spun so yeah. is that what you went with you, you ended up going with John for that first for that first run I did yeah I I really wanted it to be worsted spun because it um 
you can get well at the time you could get Hebridean yarn that was woolen spun you could mm -hmm. find it from small farms um, but I felt that the worsted spinning would give it a more luxurious feeling and whilst it's still I guess kind of rustic it's definitely got a better it it has a better quality to it yeah you can see the sheen there and that's probably because everything's lined up properly um yeah, definitely. Well, I say properly but you know lined up more than if it was woolen spun exactly yeah yeah. And I, I have to say that, you know, whenever we get a delivery from you, we're all, you know, like bees around a honeypot. We love, we love the smell of this yarn. <laughs> it, it is the best. The smell of the sheep in the field. Yeah. It really does. And it's wonderful. It's wonderful. So, so you wanted it worsted spun, which is what you got. And it was 100% Hebridean that first clip. Um, and I remember I, uh, I went to, Edinburgh Yarn Festival and I think it was your first year um mm -hmm. in 2016 and mm -hmm. I remember making a beeline to your to your uh, booth to get my two skeins of Hebridean yarn and I think it just I don't know I love dark brown well everybody knows that um I think there's plenty of demand for this lovely chocolate you know undyed deeply uh deeply interesting because you were saying, yeah. I think that, you know, different fleeces have different um, characteristics. So they're all different. Like this guy's got really red in his Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So they're all, when they're born, when the lambs arrive, they're all really, really dark, sort of the same color as the muzzle on that, on that yeah. sheet. And yeah. then as the fleeces grow, mm -hmm. some will stay very dark. Others will, will um, change to sort of russets and golds, gingers, yeah. and, that and that's usually from the sun I was going to say yeah yeah, yeah. and then as so they grow older they'll go gray as well just so like sweet. reading I yeah. think that's adorable <laughs> <laughs> so within each skein you'll yeah. find there's the yeah. mixture of the very dark with the russet with the silver yeah. and yeah. yeah so what can appear to be a very just a very plain black skein of yarn is actually more, more complex yeah yeah exactly and it's got a lovely handle to it as well probably because of that worsted spinning it feels smooth and uh and it probably has more drape as well so this is great for knitting shawls um or you know garments a sweater a cardigan something like that yeah absolutely really yeah. it doesn't we don't with the uh, worsted spun yarns we don't have them scoured a second time which is what happens with most yarns and which okay. happens with our other ranges so you will find when it's washed it will change slightly mm -hmm. as some as that as some of that lanolin is washed out so what but sort of with the handle. what sort of change should you expect i mean is it noticeable or is it just very subtle but um less lanolin-y what, what um, yeah less lanolin it will it will fluff off a little bit more yeah yeah um but it should keep it straight yeah and, uh, it so you only, feel, which is great. So, and you only scour it once. Is that why is that? Um, so I could send it for scouring again, um, but we preferred to. Well, I preferred to keep it as a natural finish. Yeah. I sometimes find in, with industrial scouring, it can get over scoured as well, yeah. which it just it just literally takes all the lanolin out, and then. Yeah you can be left with a really dry product which is yeah. a shame because it's such a beautiful fiber yeah so leaving some lanolin will also help with um it'll help with wear it'll yeah. help with washing and all those other things yeah and of course uh, scouring is washing so you know but on a, on a more industrial level although you know we're talking about small a small independent mill uh production so it's not it's not really a big commercial washing but it's more than you would do it at home uh, yes. the, the wool is all scoured at the uh at the at the fleece stage of things probably mm -hmm. and yes, then and cool. then they move through the process fascinating fascinating so <laughs> were you surprised then at the response you got well yeah it was completely and utterly i was i was just yeah totally blown away it was <laughs> um it was quite overwhelming and i because I, I didn't know how it would go and it was it was more of sort of it was a really selfish project as well that I was doing, yeah. um, you know, and just trying to create this whole provenance with yarn and yeah. working with and being able to show the sheep and the finished wool. And right. um, so it was 
but by well by the time we got to Edinburgh and the response we got at Edinburgh and following on from that it was uh, yeah I was I was totally in for the for the long term right but right yeah but I I already had work booked for my technical edit for like the next year (laughs) so um, (laughs) so it all became became a bit of a balancing act with um trying to develop the yarns and the the business and alongside my other work which I've gradually phased out of course of course so then what was your next did when were you next able to come out with a new run and what was that like yeah so the the initial run um we had it spun 100 percent hebridean mm-hmm. um but john at the mill he was struggling with the staple length because some hebridean is is quite short some's longer so he'd only managed to spin a, a fraction of that batch right and um we he said to me i can carry on spinning it worsted but we'll have to add something which is the which we're suggesting the warbles it's a very similar color we can get it from devon and it it will help it's got a longer staple length and it will help with the spinning of the the right. hebridean so we our next spin was um to incorporate 25% warbles in with the Hebridean. Mm-hmm. And we had the DK spun and then a four ply mm-hmm. was my next step. I was like, oh, well, now I've got a DK, maybe I could have a four ply. And, Love then, it. and I think you have the four ply. I have, I was just checking. I have the four ply here. That's what we were looking at. So this is 75, 25 Hebridean swarbles. And this is the heritage line That's now heritage that makeup. Line. Because this warbles just helps um, helps you end up with a lovely um, smooth yarn that is long enough to get through the worsted process. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah. And that's locally sourced by John down in Devon there. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Their um their mill is actually very close to the wool board, the wool board depot. Okay. So, nice. Yeah. They, uh, <laughs> they can work with, with the wool board really closely. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Right. So so now you had two two weights and you had your Hebridean. Did you come out with broom next? Was that the next Yeah, one? broom was the next thing. So it, I, I guess like the mission was then what can we do? with this black fiber how can we yeah. keep adding value to something that has otherwise been undervalued yeah and um and just to see how far we could take it so broom was the next thing mm-hmm. and um i'll just grab them here yeah we're uh, out of stock is- here so you you need to do the showing for us <laughs> okay <laughs> so the the broom um John suggested we adding some white fiber, um, which is Exmoor Blue Faced, we, is the one we went with. Mm-hmm. And that gives a gray, a gray tone. So that's the heritage. There and the broom go. is um, Yeah, you can see lovely. Light version. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, it's lighter, it has a, a brown undertone, mm-hmm. um, but it's still predominantly gray. And you can obviously see more of the white through it it's yeah. it's almost a melange I'd say mm-hmm. with the blending um and it is it is softer than the heritage as well slightly yeah. smidge softer right right and it's obviously a- still worsted spun as well yeah 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 and so the any patterns are completely patterns for written for heritage are right. completely interchangeable with broom it's it's spun to the same specs so yeah That's great. That's great. Um, Talking of which, uh, in your book here that we do offer, um, there is the skip with cardigan that I've been wanting and eyeing at for a long time right here. So you could knit this in Hebridean or uh, broom. Broom, Yeah, that's in the four ply. And I think it takes between three and five skeins. It's it's not bad. No, not at all for a cardigan. It's yeah. um, it has like three quarter length sleeves, and it's not yeah. particularly long. But for a nice, you know, yeah. fairly no, fairly four ply project, it's a nice project. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So, when did you come out with the book? It was twenty eighteen. Okay. All right. Yes, I see that now. Yeah. So, did you only had heritage at the time this came out, and then Broom came out after this? Do you think? Um, I think the broom had come out, but we'd already photographed everything 
yeah and yeah. mixing it up for the okay. the heritage okay. yeah yeah right. and because it was it was about where the whole book's about how the how daughter of a shepherd began and its yeah. roots are in the heritage right. line so we this is a for people that are interested in the story of your yarn this is a great book because it takes you through the beginnings of it and how you got going um so what other yarns do you have rachel so um i also have i i was with my dad at the shearing uh -huh. and and one of the shearers um we just got chatting and he said would you be interested in any other in any other fleeces mm -hmm. um he said i go around small holdings and people with a backyard flock and they'll usually say oh it's only four just throw them in the bin or yeah. yeah take them with you if you want them or yeah whatever and um he said if you like i can gather those up and um i'll give you a call at the end of the shearing season ah. i said that's that sounds fantastic thank you and, um, I got a phone call and I went to meet him and he basically got like an entire truck full of fleece that oh he gathered gosh. up which was like so much more well it was a trailer not a truck I mean I say <laughs> a truck, it was a trailer this entire trailer full of black and white fleeces oh wow um, yeah <laughs> and I was like oh okay what am I going to do with all of this <laughs> So there was oh. there was about twelve different breeds. I, I he'd written them all down for me and oh that's so nice that's brilliant. Yeah, it, was it was so it was it was just great fantastic. It was fantastic, but slightly overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, I could sort through them all and do individual spins, or I could literally just put them all together. Yeah, um, have the white spun and the black spun, and then will have some blended yes yes great so this and became the ram jam. ram jam yeah 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 which um is this range here lovely so five different shades going from cream through to black yes That's right yeah and I so know. yeah the, the creams the cream and the black are natural and the grays are blended which i think is amazing that you get gray i mean i know we're calling this black it's actually a brown oh, yeah. so brown and cream get you a gray which is a nice warm gray it's just lovely yeah and they're all were they're all woolen spun okay yeah so yeah. i had those all woolen spun in yorkshire um, yeah which i suppose you can see the difference in the spinning just looking at that mm -hmm. yeah i am a, i do love woolen spun yarns that's probably my favorite thing to knit with okay but, yeah um, but they Completely do feel different, different. yeah yeah they're, they're very different I mean the woolen spun is much area I mean that's your know, the woolen the ram jam sorry is a 50 gram hank and the yeah. heritage is 100, 100 grams and you can see that yeah. the difference is between the worsted and the woolen spinning so the yeah. woolen makes it so much more airy yep whereas exactly. the worsted spin is just drapey. amazing yeah. yeah both are beautiful but very different um but Completely different yeah yeah so, so ram jam then is a woolen spun yarn mm -hmm. and you i have this here in sport weight but you also have worsted weight we have worsted as well yeah so the worsted came first and and then followed the, by the sport yes okay. yeah and rachel what other lines of yarn do you carry or weights of yarn do you carry the other yarn that we have is a pure Hebridean lace weight, which is woolen spun at the same mill who do our ram jam. Yep. And I had wanted to do a lace weight um, again for, I mean, anything that I produce, it generally comes from a quite selfish place, but with the hope that everybody else will like it. I hope that if I like it, that you I will. Think, I think it. you have shown that you have a good barometer. <laughs> We don't know we want to until we see that you want until to. We see it. <laughs> so, and um, what happened with the lace? I've been looking for other ways to use the black fiber, the black Hebridean fiber. Um, and I had some tweed made and also some blankets, which oh, were woven okay. up at Adal Anish on the Isle of Mull. Yeah. And when the mill spun, those um the yarns for weaving they had some fiber left over and said would you like us to just spin it off as a single and that's that is what became the hebridean 
gorgeous. So it's a single ply yeah. of pure Hebridean. Yeah. Um, it knits up into a really crisp, really nice um, lace, lace weight yarn. It's, yeah. it's brilliant for things like Shetland shawls, right. anything quite intricate. Yeah. Right. And we have stock that I'm not sure we have any in stock right now, but I know we've had it. And yeah, I think any of these yarns would be great for hat knitting or any time to knit a shawl. Um, any of your Hebridean wools would be amazing uh, knitted up as a shawl. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like with the to do a traditional hat like mm -hmm. you've got behind you in yeah. graduated colors of the Ram Jam or to mix in some of the black with other with yeah. brighter pops of color from something yeah, yeah 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 and you have done some natural dyeing with woolen flower of your ram jam is that right that's right yes yeah I've that's very through. very limited in uh in you know you don't you're not able to do a lot of that no no because um jules jules dies in small batches so it's yeah. not it's not something we do large amounts of, yeah. but it was nice to, I, I work with Jules on various other projects and I like to have something. Yeah. I like to involve the, the land. The, it's, yeah. I think with the natural dye in it's because it comes from the land. Yeah. And yeah. The wool comes from the sheep from the land and it's yep. the connection between those. So yeah, I've, I've, it I've, makes I've, perfect I've, sense. It makes perfect sense. <laughs> Rachel, I, I think you've done amazing things over the last few years. What what are your plans for the future? So the, the next big, big thing that we have um, is that we are launching a sock yarn, which right. um, is, I'm, I'm so excited about. It's something I've wanted to do for, for a long time. And um, it was a project that we were discussing. I was discussing it with um, John Arben Textiles just yep. before lockdown yeah and then obviously so it took a very long time <laughs> <laughs> yeah all of that happened and um but they worked on developing it and did a test run yeah so that came through and I was like yeah let's do this and um we're basing it on the it originally started with the heritage colors so yep. the, the natural the natural dark and then the, I had, I was like, oh, well, I might as well go with a broom. And then if I've got the broom blending as well, then I might as well have a slightly lighter one. Uh -huh. So we're launching three shades, three natural shades. Yeah, show uh, us. I'll show you. First look. Oh, wow. <laughs> so exciting. <laughs> um, so it'll be three shades. Um, Beautiful. Thank you. So the dark is the heritage coloring. Heritage broom in the middle and yes. this is the new one yeah just lovely and what, what are you calling your sock yarn so it's going to be called drover which relates to it's the about somebody moving animals from one place to the other Wonderful. um which i thought made perfect sense yeah um the sock yarn it comes in uh, 50 gram hanks mm -hmm. uh worsted spun and there is 182 yards per skein. Okay. Um, so the 50 grams um, is over three colors. So you can do, there's quite a lot of scope for doing color work or doing mm -hmm. stripes or contrast heels and toes, that kind yeah. of thing. That's why right. I wanted it 50 grams. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's so that you could do color work. You definitely would still need two skeins either way um, to knit a pair of socks. Uh, just so in case people aren't sure about that. Yeah, so it comes in 50 gram skeins uh, mm -hmm. over three colors. Um, the dark is the Hebridean. Um, Hebridean and Zwarbles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with them. Um, they've all got 10% nylon, but the rest is Hebridean Zwarbles. Right. The middle one is the broom. So Hebridean Zwarbles and Exmo Blue Face. And this is the same as the broom, but in different quantities. Right. So, so get that light lovely just lovely and it's worsted spun so um that helped now what about the twist in it did you change up the twist at all yep so it's got the it's got the nylon and then we we've had extra twists put into it so they will hopefully last longer yeah. i'm really hard on my socks like me too yeah oh, on the heels i always wear through the heels yeah, and I go through the ball of my foot like yeah. it, within a week. Sometimes it's just 
Yeah. So have you tested this and, and prove, proven them? Yes. Yeah, I've been um, I've been test knitting and, and wearing. Um, here's one I knit earlier. <laughs> this is lovely. in the middle shade. Oh. Um, it needs, it needs, it's quite bouncy. It, it does have that rustic feel, but yeah, I, I've been knitting on a 2.5 millimeter needle. Okay. I, um, so about 32 stitches mm -hmm. over four inches. Okay. I, I think you've been knitting as well. I don't know if you've got to gauge. <laughs> I'm not sure that I've got to gauge, but uh, you <laughs> kindly sent over some samples and I'm knitting with the broom colorway. Um, and I'm doing a heel flap there and I've just yeah. turned it and it's lovely I'm doing a three by one little rib <laughs> I went for shorties <laughs> I, I just love turning the heel that's my favorite bit so I picked up one side need to pick up the other but uh yeah this is very springy and uh, stretchy yeah it's super stretchy yeah, yeah. it has yeah. Um, it has a lot of give in it I think it'll be great as walking socks and yes. you know yeah. every day and you know surprisingly for a two-ply yarn it's got a lot of texture I think in it mm -hmm. you know you can definitely really I think all that. the different the different colors from the fleeces help to give it more texture and yeah yeah because that's the that's the broom I don't know if you how well you can see it that's it knitted as a flat fabric so Lovely. Yeah. There's quite a lot of movement in there. Yeah, yeah. No, it's lovely. I, I'm not sure if I got gauge or if I'm even tighter. I haven't checked. I think I'm knitting this on a US one. No, a, yeah, US one, which is 2.25, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but either two and a half or 2.5 would be completely appropriate. And uh, Rachel, uh, you will be launching uh, this, I think, early summer or you know june-ish is that right well it's it's launches with you with the <laughs> so that's that's the script right there so rachel has has very generously let the woolly thistle launch her sock yarn as part of our sock bag uh, which we will be selling in June. Um, and along, you know, we did this last year where we had four different wonderful sock yarns and we're doing it again this year because it was really a hit. And Rachel's yarn, her drover, will be in our bag. So thank you for letting us um, do that. That's just so exciting. And a big I'm responsibility. <laughs> I know it's in good hands. Yeah, so it should be. And you will, um, you you are having more spun up, so that I am. Yes, yeah. yeah. We hope. Um, I'm hoping to have some by the time I do the mill open weekend, which is um, in Devon in mid June. So right. hopefully, hopefully, yeah. if I don't have all three shades, I'll, I should hopefully at least have two. Yeah. Okay. Good, 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 good. So yeah, we're very excited. I'm really enjoying knitting with it. This, this has been a little bit of secret knitting. I haven't shared this on the Shopcast yet, but I will when they're finished. Um, yeah. So we're very excited about our sock bag and uh, that will be going on sale in June, uh, which is not too far away at the time of recording this, but um, yeah. Yeah, it's good. So thank you for that. We're very excited. And of course, John Arbin is a master spinner, and he does a great job with his own sock yarn. So he knows what he's doing, uh, spinning yeah. up sock yarn for you too. Yeah, it's Very a good, great team. I think, yeah, you keep their, um, do you keep their Exmoor sock yarn? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, which is another, I mean, I, I love that yarn as well. Yeah, so. it's fantastic. Yeah, yep. Well, thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much thank for you. coming on and telling us about your new sock yarn and that the Willie Thistle gets to help launch it into the world is very exciting. So, that so good. yeah. Well, thank you. Take good care. Bye for now. Bye.